Good evening. I would like to thank you all that are here tonight and also the ones that are listening online and on YouTube. I would like to welcome you to learning how to make peace with your past. We have a special guest speaker tonight. I would like to introduce Marcy England to you. If you girls remember or you people remember from last week, we looked at the identification of shame-based identities. Tonight, Marcy's going to share with you how God has helped her overcome that issue in her life. So um, let's all welcome, welcome, yes, that's it. Let's all welcome Marcy England. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks. <clears throat> Let me get this turned on. I forgot to do that myself. Um, I just want to warn you, I do cry. Okay, and um, well, first of all, let me just do this. Thank you very much, Sharon, for allowing me to do this. I really appreciate the opportunity. I really feel like it is an opportunity. It's a pleasure. It's a, pr a privilege. And um, that's, that's how I see it. Um, if I get to where I'm sounding desperate tonight, that's because I am. I desperately want you to hear what God has put on my heart. I really do. I just feel like it's crucial, it's important, and it could be just life-changing. I mean, it could be. Okay. Um, Sharon had me speak uh, prior to this a couple years back um, at a conference that she gave at our church. I don't know how many, how many years ago was that? I think about four. About four years ago. And it was called Finally Free. Wasn't that what it called? Finally Free. And um, I gave my testimony. Um, it was... I'll just say that there was a lot of agonizing beforehand and I did counsel with Richie quite a few times. He's our, he's my pastor. I don't know if you guys know Richie or you know, I know you know Richie, but um, I did counsel with him a lot and um, to get his feedback and his encouragement and he was just wonderfully encouraging. And um, so I had, I got up there and I did it and what I'm claiming is that I got free from the shame. And um, it, it turned, maybe not like right away, but it, it's, Jesus began to work in my life. It kind of was like a turning point for me. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, more about that later. Um, I shared two very pivotal decisions that I made in my life, which I will tell you about later. Um, and I, I think it was just because I revealed it to the world that it um, wasn't tormenting me anymore. I mean, literally, Jesus took it from me. So anyway, my purpose tonight is to help us to discover what shame, what effect it has on our lives. I mean, it, it, we all know what shame is. We all have shame, like Sharon said at one time in our life, but um, I don't think that we realize how devastating effect that has on almost everything we do. Our relationships, everything. So I intend to illustrate that so that we can really get a sense of how important it is to find a way to handle that shame in our lives. So um, I'll take your attention to one of the reasons why Sharon asked me to speak. And I actually, I did, you were pointed it out. I spoke at the, at the House of Ruth too, at the girls. Um, we. Um, I used to go once a week 
and do crafts in that in the house next to the main house and um, uh, Sharon asked me to bring them and so I shared them with them it was a very special time it really was but anyway this is art therapy this is my art therapy um, my I got I've had many years of therapy and this were, these were put together in the 90s the early 1990s right after well, it was mid 1990s, right after my divorce. I was married for 25 years, and um, the divorce was quite devastating to me. And not to mention, we know that shame can start when practically when you're born, and it piles on and piles on and piles on, and then you know one thing you know, on top of the other until it becomes almost overwhelming. So I was at that point because I think that my divorce at that time kind of <laughs> sent me over the edge, just so to speak. But anyway, my therapist said, since you're an artist, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put together some images that will show me what is on the inside of you. I'm getting emotional already. <laughs> so these are my soul scars okay these are my soul scars i i hope you guys can see some of these images you can see the pain my title of this one is do you know me at the time i didn't know who i was i i'm still learning who i am i think that's something we do the rest of our lives but i really didn't know me but i my question wasn't just for me, it was for the rest of the world. Do you know me? You know, because I don't. Um, you can see here, I was kind of at my wits end, ready to explode. I don't know if you can see, Misty, can you? I had image problems of myself. There was all sorts of crying. There's babies crying. This heart over here is disapproval, that scornful look that I disapproved of myself, but others also, I felt disapproved of me. Over here is a old woman. I always had the fear of growing old and dying alone. So more babies crying. The babies crying are me, partially. And then you'll understand later, um, as I explain to you my testimony, where the other babies are found. So I don't know, I'm, I'm just giving you a few highlights here. If you take a look, that's, that would be my mother and that would be me. Don't tell anybody, cover your mouth. We'll pretend like we're a happy family, okay? Don't tell anybody how horrible it is here. Uh, that, does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> so anyway, um, then over here, um, if you go right up to, I don't know if you can all see this here. If you go right up to this corner, you can see that I recognize that I had shame that, I, that shame was pulling me into this horrible web trap, so to speak. Here's, here's more shame, hiding. Here's a face with, a, with um, a mask, desperately trying to hold my mask together and not being very successful, just being pulled in all these different directions, sort of fragmented. Um, depression, trying to hold back depression and see her fists are like this. Um, this image is of a woman pulling her face back and there's a weeping wo woman behind her face, inside of her. 
So those are just some of the points that I just sort of wanted to make with regards to these. This was extremely helpful to me because sometimes what the, what's inside of me, I'll speak for myself, what's inside of me, I can't put into words. Words just don't explain. So for me, the images told my story. It said it, to, it told the world the truth of what was going on in, in my heart, in my soul, really. So um, I might suggest that you guys do that. I, you know, um, at the time I had access to some art print books. They were real thick, just stacks of them. And so that's how I was able to get a lot of these images, which I'm not sure would be very easy to find today. But I, we, if we got a stack of magazines, I'll bet we could find a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, so if you're interested, I would be happy to come and, and spend an afternoon, maybe a couple after. It takes time. I would be happy to to do that if you're interested. It is just, it's, it's just another tool is all that is. So, um, I want to talk about shame. This is probably not new to you. Um, there are several different kinds, as I was looking stuff up, I found out there's several different kinds of shame. I didn't know that. There's, they have all these labels, they're all very clinical, you know, so on and so forth. But I'm, the shame, only shame I'm talking about tonight is toxic shame. And what's interesting, and I, w I did a lot of my research using devotions on my Bible app. And there are quite a few devotions with regard just specifically to shame. And it was interesting because one, one of those devotions called shame the silent killer. And I thought, whoa, I mean, that is strong. But if you really think about it, it, it it's true. It's so true. So um, everybody knows what shame is, basically. I don't know if I'm going to be telling you anything that's new to any of you. But I want to illustrate, <laughs> this is my crude I'm such an artist, right? <laughs> I don't I don't have a computer. <laughs> so I had to sort of write it out. This is my primitive illustration here. But I took some ideas from, um, oh, I mean, a sermon and then this and a that, and I just kind of put it all together. But I, I think it'll it's it really illustrates a lot about how shame affects us. So we all have, this is us. We have an ideal you and a bad you. The ideal you is the mask that we put on. Everybody does it. We all do it. But it isn't really you. It's more like a representation of you. And here's what Stephen, I took from Stephen Furtick. I loved his description. It says, I'm just going to read it all to you here. <clears throat> the ideal you is you trying to figure out what to say to create this person that you feel will not be rejected. I'll read that again. Good. It's you trying to figure out what to say to create the person you feel will not be rejected. Is it making a little sense? And I mean, as far as rejection goes, oh my gosh, we could do a 10 week workshop on just that alone. Rejection is, can be very devastating. But after a while, we wear this mask and this stuff is still there. The bad you, that's, that's all right, it's still there. So it's hard, it becomes difficult, it, the, the, the mask becomes inadequate after a while. And really it, it, it's difficult, I think, to begin to string 
you can have success for a little while, but it's hard to string really good days all in, in, in a row. Because the mask is really almost temporary. It's a temporary fix, really. So we have, then we have these voices that begin to tear the mask down. Um, I called, I labeled them crippling condemnations. And I have a list here, but I found a list and I'll just go through it real fast. Everybody knows these. It's, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not brave enough. I'm not healthy enough. I'm not wealthy enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I added two more. I added two more. Part of this bad you is they don't know what I did. And the other part of that is they don't know what they did to me. Yeah. Those are crippling. They're lies. Just want to put that in right now. They are all lies of the enemy. But you can see just how heavy, uh, even I, I begin to feel heavy when I'm talking about it even. So what do we do? This hurts. This is heavy. We don't want to feel this way. So we run. Where do we run to? Our addictions our feel-goods, our coping mechanisms. So it becomes like shopping, alcohol, drugs, food, that was mine, self-destruction, isolation, anger, just to name a few. You know that there is many different ways that we all escape those horrible feelings. And, um, excuse me. I just want to say here that the enemy likes to keep us here. He wants us here. And he's going to whisper in our ear and say, if you just forget about these and push them down, and you won't have to think about it, they'll go away, and then, then you just won't even think about it. It'll be all right. You'll be fine then. That's how he keeps us down. It's a lie. It's a lie. In my opinion, it, this is like a vicious cycle that we go through over and over and over again. But once I took a look at that, in my personal opinion, I don't know if this is clinically correct and I have no proof, but I really believe that these voices, this shame, is the core, the core issue behind our addictions. The absolute core. Am I wrong? <laughs> and that is why I feel so almost desperate to share this stuff because we got to get rid of it. We got to get rid of this stuff. It becomes heavy, it becomes cumbersome, and it can be a killer. That's why it's called the silent killer. So I hope this helps. I'm sure this is stuff that you have heard before a hundred times. But um, once I kind of put it into this format, it helped me to really see the bigger picture. And then I found this list of the ways, this was in one of my devotionals, of the ways that it can affect us. So listen to these. It makes you feel like you're flawed or there's something wrong with you, right? It can lead to social withdrawal. It can lead to addictions, <coughs> alcohol, drugs, spending, sex. It may cause you to become defensive and you shame other people in return. It may lead you into bullying others if you've been bullied. It may cause you to inflate 
your ego to hide that belief that you do not have value, which happens in narcissistic personalities. It may lead to physical health problems. It can be related to depression and sadness. It may leave you feeling empty. Yeah, lonely. Yeah, that lonely thing that creeps up on me. I don't know about you. It can wear you out. It may lead you to lower self-esteem. Well, that's a given. We, we, the shame makes us feel like we're not worth anything. It may make it harder for you to trust people. Can you kind of see a pattern of how it just is affecting all the parts of our life? Um, I'm not done yet. It may make it harder for you to be in therapy or to stop feeling as though you are being judged. You know, when I gave that presentation a few years back, man, I was, I thought, man, they're not going to, they're going to judge me. These, these women, after they hear what I've done, oh my gosh, they're going to judge me. I was really afraid of that. And I, and I really had to counsel with Pastor Richie over that. And he, and he just said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If this is between you and God, it really doesn't matter what they think. This is not why you're doing this. So he, you know, redirected my focus. <laughs> Thank goodness. But that is a true. That's, we're all afraid of what people are going to think at times. So a couple more. We may, it may cause you to engage in people-pleasing. Okay, that would be a little bit of me, or maybe a lot of me. <laughs> um, I don't know if you recognize any of these for you guys or not. Yeah? It may cause you to avoid talking because you are afraid to say the wrong thing. Oh, my gosh. It may cause you compulsive or excessive behaviors like strict dieting overworking, excessive cleaning, or having too high standards in general. Some of us iron our socks and... <laughs> I'm sorry, Sharon. I had to throw that in. <laughs> She's a compulsive ironer. Okay, so we tease her about that when she irons her socks. <laughs> it's, that's right, in front of the world. <laughs> I don't know, I just had to lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> oh my goodness. But anyway, this lit, I mean, can you begin, even just begin to see how toxic shame is? I mean, it affects everything, our conversations, our opinion of others, our opinion of ourselves, our trust levels, um, everything. Um, so I, I, again, I just want to say, I believe that hanging on, this is baggage. It's baggage. Hanging on to this baggage. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I keep hitting this, the mic. Um, hanging on to this baggage is devastating. It becomes like a brick wall that you can't get past. Um, it'll paralyze you so that you can't grow. Um, I, I guess I could go on and on, but I think you've got my point. And um, what I want to tell you from here is that shame is all lies. All lies. Because we are valuable we are valuable to God. So I'm done with the gloom and doom. I'm going to switch over to the good news. Okay? We, that we can have a new life in Christ. That 
he can lift. He wants to take this burden from us. We need to give it to him. He wants it. He doesn't want us to be hurting. He doesn't want us to criticize ourselves. He doesn't want us to run away. He doesn't want us to be addicted to anything. And in my opinion, the only way that I can see that I could change my life is to give God this baggage. Once I give him, because I'm just speaking for myself, once I give him, gave him that baggage, it opened up just like a whole new world for me. And it, changed, it can just change the whole direction of your life. If you really, and I think we're all here for the same reason to look for ways to get better and look for ways to change our lives, to be different. We don't want to be that person anymore. We want to be a new person, a different person. That new person is the only one that will be able to succeed in doing things different. What's the definition of, what's the definition of, what's the word I want? Insanity. Insanity, thank you. Is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. If we keep hanging on to this baggage and hanging on, hanging on, and hanging on, we will not be able to get the results that we want. I, that's a guarantee. So I have written down here, returning to Christ is our only answer to rid ourselves of this poison. It's poison. In order to do that, we need Jesus, of course. You know where I'm going with this. It's Jesus. And we need a daily dose of him. Because it's a daily choice to follow him. It's a daily choice to listen to his voice and not the enemy. Because he'll attack us every day. He's sneaky. He comes silently. He comes around the corner when you least expect. He, and, and he still, I am not completely without shame. It creeps in. And I start saying, oh gosh, I can't, I'm not, I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I'm just not good enough. I can't, you know. As soon as I, I'm getting better, as soon as I recognize that, I allow Jesus' voice to be louder and I can tell the enemy to shut up. You don't belong in my head in the name of Jesus. Be gone. And I'm getting, I'm getting really good at doing that. I really am. If I'm feeling like I'm getting a little bit depressed or I'm getting low, I don't camp out there anymore. It doesn't set up camp like pa pastor says that all the time. It's not to let it set up camp in your brain, in your mind. So I want to give you a few scriptures here. And I want to say even Jesus in scripture is aware that we as human beings carry this stuff unnecessarily. There's two scriptures I chose. Here is 1 John 1 verse 9. And it reads, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And the key word here is confessing our sins. He wants us to give him the poison, the junk. In Proverbs, I found this one. Proverbs 28, verse 13. People who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. So he's, he couldn't make it any plainer. So the good news is we are forgiven, that Jesus is the answer. I'm 
going to say he's the only answer. And if, I, well, and from here I want to say, is, that, is, is it easy to give your testimony? Which I think I skipped over in my notes, <laughs> which I will get to, but is that, is it easy? No, I, I don't think it's easy. You have to dig deep and you have to make that decision and you have to find somebody you can tell that you can trust. And uh, maybe that's a therapist, maybe that's a best friend, maybe it's a sponsor or maybe it's a counselor or whatever, you know, just, but I can't even, I can't stress enough just how important it is to find that person, to dig deep and to get rid of the stuff that we think we have to keep secret from the world. So, um, I guess I, yeah, I did. I skipped over my testimony, but anyway, okay. A little bit about me. Um, when I gave my presentation before, I had it all written out, and I read every little line. But, and I looked at it. I still have it here. It's right here. And I read over, and I thought, what? Okay, I don't need to say that. I don't need to say this. So I'm just going to wing it here and just tell you that I came from an extremely dysfunctional family. Is anybody here willing to say that they didn't come from? <laughs> Raise your hand if you didn't come from. Oh, quit. So, <laughs> but, um, so I can't, and it, my father was extremely abusive, okay? Um, verbally, verbally. Nobody ever did anything right. He was a rageaholic. I think you guys remember, we talked about that. He's a rageaholic. And um, nobody in the family was able to escape his wrath. I think he was also bipolar, to be perfectly honest with you, because he was just all over the map with his emotions. Um, my mother was very weak emotionally, so she sort of was like a doormat. And she would go behind him and explain and try to say, oh, he didn't really mean that. He, he didn't really mean, he, you know he loves you. He, he didn't mean what he said. Well, what is a kid supposed to do with that? <laughs> you know, when he's told you that you're nothing and you're dirt, and mother comes along and says, oh, he really loves you. It's extremely confusing. But anyway, my sister um, and I never got along. She hated the day. I, she was three years older than me, and she hated the day I came home from the hospital. She as much as told me that several times <laughs> throughout her growing up years. We were never close. We didn't play together. It was just bizarre. And when I think back, I really think, that wasn't her fault. It wasn't my fault. I think that our parents sort of fostered it because we sure, certainly couldn't have made that up by ourselves as kids. And, um, and so, and my sister and I haven't been closed for many, many years. I mean, here's the blessing. Here's the blessing. And, and if there's anybody in your life that you are estranged from, this will give you hope because God, God has worked in my relationship with my sister. Just this year, we have gotten closer than I would have ever dreamed in my life. I finally have a sister. And we are having, we're sort of getting to know each other. Because, I mean, we would go a year, maybe. Maybe we would talk at Christmas. Maybe we'd talk on our birthdays. But that was about it. So we've gone many, many years without each other, and now I have her in my life, and I was so grateful. I was so, I'm sorry, I'm so grateful. Joni, when you watch this, I love you. <laughs> anyway, um, that was a God thing. 
And so believe that God can really restore relationships as well. I just threw that in there. Well, anyway, um, so, and I was a scapegoat. We talked about our roles in the family. I was a scapegoat, so I was the youngest and everything was my fault. Um, I was molested when I was four years old by an uncle. Um, I really buried that and didn't have any real memory of it until I was in my 30s. I was in therapy and it all came rushing back. And I kind of went through this, what they called PTSD at the time. So, I mean, I, I just, I was devastated. I, I, I cried constantly. This went on for about a month. What, what she did with that though, was she took all the big picture and all the pieces of me and she put it all together and we took a look and it just my life and my decisions in my life began to make sense to me because don't you know when you're molested as a child it changes you it does something to your soul I mean for me I was, I was sexually active at a very young age. And to me, I, I sought after men and sex and that was my addiction. I became extremely promiscuous. And she explained to me that's where it began. Um, so I went off to college. I had a boyfriend in high school, naturally he was my partner. And uh, then I went off to college. I really did not want to be there. I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't emotionally ready for it at all. But I went because that was what I was supposed to do. And um, I got raped. Well, of course, I knew at that time, I'm saying that I felt like it was my fault. I knew it was my fault. It had to be my fault, right? Because I was already, in my mind, damaged goods, garbage, nothing. So I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody, I don't know, for years. I didn't tell my mother until I was in my 60s. And um, yeah, that's what we women do with rape a lot of times. So. I quit school. I went to three semesters at, at Illinois State University. So I quit school. I went home. Well, then I had to move back in with my father. Um, that was ugly. I, but I did get a job. I got a really good job. Well, of course, I'm still looking for men. I'm still looking for sex. I'm still looking for validation. I'm still looking for love. I'm still looking for a way to fill the emptiness the loneliness, the worthless feeling that I had. So I met this guy, oh my gosh, fell in love, oh my gosh. He was all that and a bag of chips. We got engaged. He was in the Navy because I was raised in Waukegan, Illinois, which is right next to Great Lakes Naval Training Center. So any guy I met would have been in the Navy. <laughs> so we got engaged, it was wonderful. And then he got transferred to California. So a few weeks later, I got on a plane and I flew out there and to LA and oh, we got this motel room and spent this wonderful weekend together, went to Disneyland. It was wonderful at the end of the weekend before it just, he took me to the plane and just before I got on the plane, he said, give me the ring back. I don't want to be engaged anymore. Well, guess what? I went home and found out I was pregnant. I never heard from him again. Okay, so my father, the most important thing in his life was his image in the community. He was the president of the Easter Seal Society and the this and the men's club and the this and elder and deacon in the church and head of the committee for, to put in the new organ. And I mean, I could go on and on. He was all about his image. 
Well, I mean, in, back in those days, and we're talking 50 plus years ago, that was a pretty shameful thing to bring to a family. It's a daughter who got pregnant. <clears throat> My mother was equally as devastated because she was the town soloist. She would sing at every concert and every wedding and every funeral and at church, and she was the choir director. So you can see how important that was for them to preserve. So I got sent away. Two, two towns over and went through an adoption agency. I lived as a nanny for a single mother and, and her three kids. And uh, I got paid $25 a week. <laughs> and I had one day off, but then that was the day I had to go to the clinic, so it really wasn't a day off. So that was pretty grueling, but I did have to make a decision to give that baby away because no one in my family supported me. No one. Back in those days, they didn't have WIC and, you know, they didn't have welfare and all, you know, all the Planned Parenthood. They didn't have anything like that. So since I didn't have the support of my family and he was gone, the father, I had no choice. So I had a boy and um, I guess you can see why some of these images of the babies crying are showing up in my, my collages. And uh, I actually would walk down the, the hallway to look through the glass at him every day. They, were, they did not like it. I wasn't supposed to, but I had to. And I would just stare and just stare and stare and stare. Well, it came time to sign the papers, and I said, I'm not going to sign the papers until I hold him. Well, we don't do that. That's totally uncustomary. I won't sign the papers until I hold him. So I did. They allowed me to hold him. They were afraid I had changed my mind, but no, I just wanted to hold him. So I have, I go back to my job. They held my job for me. And, uh, I go to, well, then at that point, my father decided he was just going to kick me. I wasn't welcome to live there anymore, so he kicked me out. He drove me to the town where I had the baby, put me in a YWCA. Do they have those anymore? I don't know. Yeah. They do. Check me into a YWCA, paid, me, paid two weeks in advance, and said, have a nice life, and walked away. Well, I had no, I'd never lived by myself before. I had no skills. I didn't know how to do a checkbook. I mean, I just didn't know how to do anything. I was completely lost. So, of course, what do I do? I'm going to start looking for men again, right? That's the only thing I know how to do. That's the only thing I knew to fill that emptiness. So I started sleeping around. We would go to the bars or at the, all were on the, uh, the base. The base had these bars, you know. The Fleet's Inn was one of them. <laughs> I don't know why I just remember the name of it. And I met this guy in the Fleet's Inn and uh, he was playing pool. He thought it was so cute. So we start going together, and guess what? I got pregnant. Well, this was only about six months after I gave this baby up. So you'd think I would know better, but no, I, I didn't. I was, uh, no, I, I, I was lost. I was lost. Well, anyway. So I couldn't tell my dad, oh my gosh, I couldn't tell, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. 
I felt like my only choice was to have an abortion. And that's what I ended up doing. In those days, you couldn't go to a clinic. You had to go underground. They call them back alley uh, abortions. I ended up in the basement of a foot doctor's home somewhere in downtown Chicago and paid 350 for him to do this abortion. There were people walking. Uh, it was like I almost didn't even have privacy. There were just men walking, just walking casually around while I was, it was just the most bizarre, horrifying experience. But praise God, he was skillful enough that he didn't do any permanent harm to my body. And I was then, shortly after that, met my husband, got married, and have my son. So that's kind of my story. I think you can see now some of these images, what they represent. Back to the good news though, that's not me anymore. That's not me anymore. So I have a couple more scriptures that I want to read. And let me see if we can, here we go. This is one of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 103, and this is verses 8 through 12. Sharon, you, I'm going to be calling you in a minute. This is the way it reads. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve because, you know, basically we are all sinners. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. And this is my favorite part. He has removed our sins as far as us, as from the east is from the west. So, I mean, if you take a look at a globe and you know east and west, it's this continual circle, never ending. And that is, this verse has just always been a favorite of mine. It's kind of like my go-to when I'm feeling down and I, I just have to remind myself how much he loves us and how far his unending forgiveness goes. So I'm going to ask Sharon just to do a little illustration here of how Jesus' blood covers this. It's gone. It doesn't belong to me anymore. This doesn't belong to me anymore. I gave it to him. I gave it to him that day that I did that testimony that first time. And I just want to say, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he has so much for you. He has so much love, so much forgiveness. He has the ability to change you from the inside out. And really what I want you to understand and remember is that you can experience his unfailing love, like it said in the scripture, his unending forgiveness. And he can give you a new life. I really believe in my heart of hearts and my soul that the only way that I could get away from all that ugliness and awfulness is to trust him and give it to him. 
do we want to remain stuck? Do we really want to remain stuck in the muck? Because that's where we would stay if we don't decide to give this to Jesus. And part of that is not just talking to Jesus. You need to get it out. You need to get it out to someone. You need to write it out. You need to read it to somebody. You need to find, find a way. It might not all come out at, at first. God works wonders in us in layers. You, you always talk about the layers. Just one at a time, he peels it away. But we have to trust him. We have to trust him. And I really believe that it's an important, I can't even, I just want to get up and yell to everyone just how crucial and life-changing it is to get rid of the shame. We can't progress we can't grow, we can't even get close to God if we don't give it to him. So my prayer is basically, oh, I have another scripture. This is the one I will close with. This is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. It reads, Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. So my prayer would be that you would think about what I've said, think about how crucial it is, how important it is. It's the only way that I can see that would change anyone's life. Um, it's a choice an important choice, and I hope you make that choice for you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. I've gotten my instructions. Thank you for watching, and um, I hope that you'll take what our dear Sister Marcy has said to you and that you will think about ways that you can apply it to your life. Please, please join us again in two weeks as we take a continued look at not only how shame affects us, but how things that were said to us and things that were said about us can have a long lasting effect. That will be, I believe, on November 4th, 3rd, 4th, at first, first Thursday in November. So um, join us back the 4th, the 3rd. Thank you. I've got, my, I've got my people back there with their calendars, and they said November 3rd, 6.30. Come join us. Thank you. Bye.